This lecture summarizes the knowledge about the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis. I'm going to talk about the etiology, the risk factors, and the different theories, the lipid theories, and the non-lipid theories we mentioned as well. The atherosclerosis cause death, is a leading cause uh, of the death uh, over the world. About 0.83 million per year uh, people die due to coronary heart diseases or cardiovascular diseases or anything that is, could be correlated to the atherosclerosis. It means, if I translate to directly, it means about every 37 second is one death is due to or somehow is related to atherosclerosis. If you look around in a normal lecture hall, about every third one of you will have coronary vascular diseases and can die due to this problem. Now before we start the pathogenesis, we have to specify some terminology. Arteriosclerosis is called a term that usually describing any hardening or loss the elasticity of the medium or large arteries. And it's coming from the Greek arterio, meaning artery, and sclerosis, that meaning hardening. Arteriosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, is any hardening and loss of elasticity of the arterioles, the small arteries. It's often due to hypertension and uh, diabetes, diabetes. Atherosclerosis is the hardening of an artery, specifically due to the arteriomatosis plaque formation. So there are three things, arteriosclerosis, arteriosclerosis and arteriosclerosis. Now, how this atherosclerosis can be manifested that usually this is a disease of the 21st century. Usually as about 40 or 54% of the atherosclerosis manifested as a coronary heart diseases that can be as a angina pectoris, myocardial infarction, or sudden cardiac death. About equal portion, 18 and 70 percent, can cause, for example, cerebral vascular diseases that manifested as a transient ischemic attack or TIA or stroke, or some others, peripheral vascular diseases that can be intermittent caudication or gangrene, for example, or aortic aneurysm or aortic dissection renal artery stenosis, or mesenteric occlusion. Let's see a case report. Uh, she is a 76-year-old woman. In anamnestic data include hypertension, cardiac heart diseases, dilated cardiomyopathy, appendectomy, C-section, and she has been admitted to the hospital due to the severe epigastric pain developed after eating, the pain was localized in the right upper quadrant. There was no fever, cough, or sputum. She had nausea, but she did not vomit. There was no blood in the feces. Its color wasn't black. Urinalysis was normal. There was no chest pain. The abdominal pain was cramped or do like. Metimazole did not relieve the pain at home. So the patient was taken to the hospital by ambulance. She was doubled up in the car and kept her both hands on her belly. On physical examination, everything was normal, except her abdomen was clearly sensitive on palpation. At the lab results, slightly increase in the white blood cell count, hyperkalemia, CRP, and troponin was negative. Everybody was believing that possible that's a diaphragmatic MI, or, but on ECG or, or lab, they didn't show anything. 
Abdominal ultrasound was normal except some about four times five millimeter record dense shadows in the right pelvis. So they diagnosed nephrolithiasis, lateral dextra, uterolithiasis, light dextra, lateral dextra. So everybody was satisfied. Okay, nephrolithiasis, but the pain should be different from, but it, it was maybe an epigastric area. Okay, but the, let's see, the physician didn't believe this uh, diagnosis. So they controlled the lab after six hours later, electrolyte back to the normal, close to the normal, and troponin still was negative. An additional four hours later, but because she still had the same pain, other proponin was sent to the lab and be positive, so everybody was satisfied, good, so this is a MI. So she was taken to the cardiovascular intensive care unit due to myocardial infarction. On the way to the center, abdominal defense developed, so peritonitis, and the patient died shortly after arriving to the center. Now, what could be the problem with this patient? Yes, the patient had acute mesenteric ischemia or acute mesenteric occlusion or thrombosis or embolization. There are some, let's see, clinical signs and some predisposing factor that could be associated with acute mesenteric ischemia. But which are these clinical signs? Usually, this mesenteric occlusion accompanied with a sharp postprandial pain, and that is very, very localized. In our case, yes, the patient had the problem after eating. Nausea or vomiting is associated with it, and bloody stool. Now, in our case, there was no blood in the stool. However, atrial fibrillation or cardiomyopathy, especially the dilatative cardiomyopathy, when we do have a possibility of thrombus formation, that is a very strongly associated with this mesenteric occlusion. Now, very difficult to diagnose, however, the acute mesenteric occlusion. The best one, if we can do immediately a visceral angiography, however, is not an easy one, or abdominal CT, or chair x-ray, and other tests to exclude the other possibilities, and whatever is left, that could be the mesenteric ischemia. Now, the frequency of this mesenteric ischemia or occlusion is relatively very high. One to two out of thousands of hospitalized admission is associated. However, if somebody is taken to the hospital due to a GI problem, now this percentage goes up to 1%. However, the mortality is relatively very high, about 70 to 100%. That could be due to the necrosis and due to the sepsis. Now, what we are going to talk about, about atherosclerosis. First of all, I will mention something about the evolution of the process of development of uh, atherosclerosis. Later on, I'm going to talk about the lipid theory of atherosclerosis. And, of course, the non-lipid theories we mentioned and the risk factors as well. Now let's see the progressive or progression of atherosclerosis. Basically, that's a very silently ongoing disease. Usually started right away after being born and takes about 30, 40, 50 years when you, if you are lucky, when you do have the first sign of this occlusion that is caused by atherosclerosis. And this occlusion should be about at least 70% of the lumen occluded when you can have the first sign that is called this F4 angina or claudication, when you, when you need an extra effort, extra cardiac output, when you do have, let's see, less coronary flow and you do have the clinical sign. Now later on, or maybe earlier, when we do have a ruptured plaque, so this plaque that is very slowly growing on, that could be the stable plaque. The other plaque that can be ruptured, that's an erosive plaque. And when the erosive plaque develops, now the patient will have the unstable angina, 
the myocardial infarction, the coronary death, the stroke, and critical leg ischemia. So these are the very important clinical signs that usually meaning that we do have a thrombus that adhere to this erosive plaque and that's liberated and plugging, let's say, the smaller or bigger artery. Now, how can we evaluate the changes of the vessels and changes of arteries, the structure of the arteries? Basically, the first one, when we do have the ultrasonography and we can measure the thickness of the intima, and when it's a little bit increases, that could be the first sign when the lipid accumulation or the thickening of the artery occurs. Later on, we can perform an uh, intravenous ultrasound when we can detect the percentage of atheroma volume. Later on, when the occlusion is about 70% or close to 70%, now we can use, the, for example, the quantitative coronary angiography. And later on, if you want to see something about the structure of the sclerotic plaque, we can use the CMR, the cardiac magnetic resonance test. Uh, in this case, when we do have a gradually accumulating plaque and that's narrowing the artery, that's very nice because the clinical symptoms develops the gradually and the patient won't have an acute attack. However, many heart attacks came out of the blue sky. There is no but let's see sign that could show that the patient could have any kind of coronary narrowing. So, and the plaque that usually is associated with the plaque, that rapture, and usually it's not associated with any kind of, let's see, uh, narrowing. It can be maybe it's not thickening the wall. Maybe you have the only the endothelial damage, and this can form an injury, and that cannot have the platelet, and that can accumulate the platelet, aggregate the platelet, and this is what is liberated and we're going to form some black, uh, thrombus formation. Another thing, the therapies that focus on the widening the blood passage in semi-occluded arteries, such as the balloon or some uh, stent, for example, the viral cage stent, can seize angina, but very frequently fail to prevent further heart attack. Usually, they are going to impregnate the stent that liberate some drug, usually that is a, this preventing the uh, thrombus uh, adhesion and aggregation. But this is why it's usually is difficult to see when this heart attack is going to develop. And now, how can we somehow evaluate the cause of atherosclerosis? First of all, statistically, that you like statistics very nicely, the risk assessment, basically meaning that let's evaluate those things that is associated with atherosclerosis. Now, there are several risk factors that associate with atherosclerosis. We can categorize them, such as the non-modifiable risk factor, such as age. For example, when you are getting older, you have a higher chance to develop atherosclerosis. The atherosclerosis develops in young, but doesn't precipitate organ injury until the late in later life. Gender, for example, men more prone than women. But by the age of 60 to 70, after the postmenopause, in postmenopause, but they have the equal frequency. Family history, if you do have a genetic predisposition, you cannot modify it. And some other non-modifiable factor, for example, the custom, the, the family custom or the traditions, because the family usually living a certain lifestyle. And as a child, you cannot do anything about it. Your parents can do something about it. So again, you cannot modify what happened with you in your early ages. Of course, there are zillions of modifiable risk factors, so you don't need to worry about that. You cannot do anything about the plaque formation, such as, for example, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, cigarette smoking, diabetes mellitus, elevated homocysteine level, factors that affect the hemostasis or thrombosis, certain agent, infection agents, such as a 
herpes viruses, chlamydia, CMV, obesity, sedentary life, stress, etc., so etc. So so you can list a lot. And if you control these diseases or the lifestyle, you change the lifestyle, you can lower the modifiable risk factors. Now, for example, here, uh, this was a Birmingham study when they evaluating the increasing total cholesterol, let's see, level and the chronic heart risk per thousand patients in six years. And not only the cholesterol was in one factor, but there are some additional ones, such as hypertension, such as hypertrichosuridemia, smoking, low HDL level. As you see, there are an increase. So there's some kind of additional or multiply. And if you have more, you have a much higher risk to develop a chronic heart diseases. The next one, uh, we can see something about the development of atherosclerosis if we know what do we have inside the plaque. For example, let's look at the history of the plaque. As you see here, this is a plaque, and we do have a center that is a necrotic center that contains some cell debris, cholesterol crystals, form cells such as the macrophage that accumulated with cholesterol and calcium calcification. And on the surface in the fibrosis cap, we do have smooth muscle cells, macrophages, foam cells, lymphocytes, collagen, elastin, proteoglycans, and neovascularization. So it's showing some characteristic feature of a chronic inflammatory process. The next one, if we do have some idea about the development of atherosclerosis, okay, let's do some experimental approach and let's develop some animals and prove it that that variation of the risk factors or that other component, it will promote the development of atherosclerosis. For example, this one, that the LDA receptor uh, deficiency mass will develop, let's see, cholesterol, precipitation in the aorta very suddenly. And especially here, we do have the oxidized LDL, as you can see here on the uh, grub, adiogram. Now, this is why first the big theory that came into the uh, picture, that was the lipid or infiltration theory. Because what we have, cholesterol we found in the vessel wall, yes we do have some elevated cholesterol level or blood lipid in this patient. And the animal experiment uh, evidences, for example, they were fed, let's see, the rabbits with cholesterol, and they developed, that was the first experiment, and they developed atherosclerosis. But a rabbit never ever met with cholesterol. They, because they're eating, let's see, phytosterols, let's see, flowers and green stuff, green vegetables, they never, ever eaten animal source. Another one, the epidemiological observation in those basically uh, population, they did do have an elevated cholesterol level, they did have an elevated atherosclerotic level, etc. So, et so. Or between population studies for comparing to the French, compared to the other areas, or within population studies or migration studies. For example, if you migrate from one country to another one and you start to customize with another food habit, then the risk is going to be altered. Or intervention studies when you treat, for example, the cholesterol levels, you're lowering the cholesterol, you're lowering the uh, cardiovascular risk as well. And cholesterol and nutritional studies. So there are several hypotheses, several proof for these lipid infiltration steroids. Now, this lipid infiltration theories is a very strongly confirmed theories. However, they figure out that if you look at, for example, this Gaussian curve, whoever had, let's see, chronic heart diseases, as you see here, about 35%, almost one quarter of the patient lives with a low cholesterol level, but they still has chronic heart diseases. So not only the cholesterol is going to alter 
the atherosclerosis, the formation of atherosclerosis, but something else. So this is how the non-lipid theories came into the picture. I'm going to say more about the non-lipid theories and the lipid theories if I think you already heard something in the biochemistry or physiology. So let's concentrate on the non-lipid theories. Now, of course, the non-lipid theories is a very, very diverse theories. And again, it's depending on what you found in the atherosclerotic plaque histologically, such as the thrombogenic theory, Mesenheimer theory, free radical theory, immunity theory, mutagenic theory, infection theory, response to injury theory, unifying theory, progenitor cell theory, and et cetera, et cetera. You can list it. Now let's look at these theories. First of all, it's very old theory, the thrombogenic theory, and they are still working with this theory, and you can get some food supplementation to somehow reduce your risk. What it says, because you already found that it black, you do have some platelet, and it's essential to have some platelet that have to be thrombus. What they say that, okay, we do develop some micro injuries, and they develop on the vascular intima. The platelet is going to be adhered to this area, and of course, be activated, be aggregated, releasing certain substances, vasoactive substances, that is going to promote the lipid infiltration. Now, the modern thrombogenic theory that stating that it's very important to evaluate the thromboxane and the prostacyclic ratio, so the thrombogenic and the anti-thrombogenic ratio. So if we do have more thromboxane, that we tend to have more aggregation. If we do have a more endothelial relaxing, dilating agent such as a prostacyclin, or inhibiting the platelet aggregation, yeah, we want. So this is why they apply this omega-3 free fatty acids or using the low dose of aspirin. How does it work? If you apply, for example, the fish oil, you already heard about the fish oil for sure. If you eat too much or relatively you fill up your lipid stores with this omega-3 fatty acid, what will happen? These omega-3 fatty acids be a source of thromboxane and prostacyclin. It will go to form TXA3 and prostacyclin 3. Now, 3XA3 is completely, uh, uh, let's say, ineffective thrombogenic agent. However, the prostacyclin uh, PGI3 is still dilated. The low-dose aspirin has a different effect. Low-dose aspirin relatively irreversible blocking the, uh, pro, uh, the cyclooxygenase enzyme and mostly the COX-1. And what will happen? In the platelet, because that's irreversibly blocking the cyclooxygenase enzyme in the platelet, one pill of aspirin is locking out or knocking out the prostaglandin production or the thromboxane production that's mainly coming out from the platelet, knocking out in the platelet production. However, because the platelet doesn't have any uh, nucleic or nucleus or protein synthesis, why in the endothelium they can have new protein synthesized, and this is why they are shifting the ratio by increasing the prostacyclin production from the endothelium and decreasing the production of thromboxane in the platelet, and this is how they achieve relatively, uh, let's see, a more fluidity in the blood and fat aggregation. The Mesenheimer theory, it says in the saying that the matrix is going to be altered. And because the matrix is altered, that can promote the deposition of lipids. As you know, by age, for example, the collagen level increases while the elastic fiber content is decreases. So the mass of the matrices will increase gradually and more chance to do have, let's see, lipid accumulation. Now, the etiology, for example, at the vascular wall ischemia, for example, the catecholamine effect that will cause a contraction of vasorum and bad nicotine, for example, as a smoking, it's real effect of catecholamine, hypertension, the mechanical compression of the vessel wall. So everything is going to alter and affecting the matrix remodeling. And 
this is happening with normal aging as well. So as you can get more advanced age, you will have less elasticity and more collagen. Now the pathophysiology says that, okay, the hyaluronic acid level decreases, the permeability of the basement membrane of intivites increases, and lipid infiltration is much easier, so relatively can go below the endothelial cells, and the water content of the valve will decrease, and metabolic function decreases. So this is how relatively it's going to initiate the lipid accumulation in the subendothelial area. And heparin, heparized sulfate is decreases, and the anti-thrombogenic activity that located the surface of endothelial cell, it will decrease. This will affect the hemostasis, so that will cause and let's see, cause formation later on. Additionally, to the lipid accumulation. Now, if we go on, there is another theory that was a very interesting theory that's called the monoclonal or mutagenic or transformation theory. Now, this came the picture that the tumor and the atherosclerosis had similarity. So, if you are looking at, for example, the risk factors of tumors or atherosclerosis, they are very common ones. For example, the smoking can promote both. Sexual steroids, some estrogen, androgens can promote both. Aging, autoimmunity, or heat shock protein 16 virus can promote both. Oxidative stress, free radicals can promote both. Inflammatory processes occurring in both. Infection, inflammatory cascade deterioration, yeah, the chronic inflammation, it will promote both atherosclerosis plus tumor. For example, a H. pylori infection can promote tumor as well. And in both cases, the angiogenesis as a chronic inflammatory process is working as well. And diet positively or negatively influences relatively similarly both atherosclerosis or tumor. And additionally, uh, Er, Bandit, about in 1973, it proposed that atherosclerotic lesion is as a benign smooth muscle tumor. And what they did, they normal, uh, they isolated the cells and they measured, let's see, the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And they found out there are two types of dehydrogenase, A and B allele. And in most plaque has only one type of allele, or A or B allele. The next theory that I'm going to talk about, and uh, that's the, the inflammatory theory or inflammation theory. Uh, there are several line of evidence suppose that there is an ongoing chronic inflammation in the plaque, in the atherosclerotic plaque. However, there are other evaluation. For example, they compare the CRP as an acute inflammatory C-reactive protein and the correlation and the as chronic heart disease relation. As you see here, that relatively, if you do have some CAR tears in women and men, not only, let's see, the cholesterol content, but it looks like the C-reactive protein amount is going to alter the risk of the chronic heart diseases. So if somebody has, let's see, is still in a normal range, the CRP level is still in a normal range because usually it's less than eight or nine. But as you see here, if somebody lives with a CRP level less than two, they do have, let's see, one relative risk. However, if they do have, for example, a nine, level nine, it's meaning that the risk is about three times more or in women at least about five times more. Now, Another important thing is that in the plaque, as you remember, there are some pathogens. They could show some pathogens, some viruses, such as the cytomegaloviruses, such as the herpetiform viruses, herpes simplex virus type 1 and type 2, hepatitis A virus, chlamydia pneumonia, or helicobacter pylori infection. And another thing that if somebody is tested, for example, the uh, titer of the antibody in the host, they were correlated with the chronic heart diseases and the presence of this uh, in, uh, agent. If you have more antigens or more antibody against these agents, the relative risk is higher. Now, other thing that is still is on, and that's the response to injury hypothesis. That meaning that there are certain factors that causing endothelial injury. 
that can be free radicals, can be hypertension, so something altering the endothelium, and that can cause endothelial dysfunction. And this endothelial dysfunction is going to induce a chronic inflammatory processes. And what will happen? These inflammatory processes causing the migration and the differentiation of the smooth muscle cells from the media to the intima. And these smooth muscle cell proliferation in the intima can cause an accumulation of extracellular matrix protein and lipid deposition. So this is very slowly is going and uh, accumulates the plaque and forms the plaque in the arm. Now, what can cause endothelial dysfunction, such as the modified LDL, such as a small LDL, as I mentioned when we discussed, for example, the metabolic syndrome or diabetes mellitus, for example, and oxidized LDL that is modified by the free radicals, genetic alteration, of course, or homocysteine concentration elevation, or infectious microorganisms, as before we mentioned that, uh, herpes virus, for example, CMV virus, or, or, or uh, hepatitis A virus, or chlamydia pneumonia viruses. But it's only one problem with this virus, they are living inside the cells. And it can be buried, can be hidden, and the immune system cannot kill all, vi all viruses or, or pathogens, for example, the chlamydia and intracellular pathogens, and it's persisting in your body. You meet with this virus relatively early in your age, but your immune system somehow cannot eradicate all of them. It's with antibiotics, you cannot treat it. So these patients, whoever has an increased, let's see, antibody or presence of this um, infection agent, they have a higher risk to have chronic heart diseases. And of course, if you combine this all risk factor, the chance to develop an endothelial dysfunction is much higher. Now, the unifying hypothesis relatively is going to combine the lipid theory with the non-lipid theory, such as, for example, the LDL accumulation or modified LDL that's usually altering the uh, causing the dysfunction of the endothelial layer, and monocyte adhesion, platelet adhesion, growth factor liberation, cytokine liberation, small muscle cells activation, and this is how it's built up the atherosclerotic plaque, Plus, the lipid is going to form, let's see, the food for the macrophages, and that will cause the form cell formation, plaque remodeling, and later on, if this all is an orchestrated manner, that can cause the plaque rupture, and that the plaque rupture leads to uh, adhesion of the platelets, cause thrombosis, and it's going to accumulate the plaque, so the growing of the plaque, and somehow the cardiovascular event is going to happen. Now, the homocysteine, as I mentioned, the homocysteine, usually the homocysteine is important in the uh, amino acid turnover, and you already met with this one in the biochemistry study. So usually that's depending on the folate and B12, so the vitamin level, and the methionine breakdown, how this forming this is homocysteine level. In some high, in some patients, the homocysteine level is increased one. If they do have some enzyme defect, for example, the uh, MTHFR, for example, uh, enzyme deficiency. But in other case, if you eat too much red meat, for example, if you do have too much uh, methionine level, again, you can have an elevated homocysteine level. So what will happen with this homocysteine? If the homocysteine level is increases, that will alter relatively of the LDL molecules, and because they are forming more relatively reactive oxygen spaces, that can lead to lipid peroxidation, or that can induce cell proliferation, oxidation, endothelial dysfunction, and this leads to uh, atherothrombosis. So relatively, the homocysteine that causes endothelial injury that prothrombotic, and it will trigger the synthesis of the collagen, that will decrease the nitric oxide production, plus it can promote the smooth muscle cell migration. Another interesting theory 
is the progenitor theory or the stem cell theory. What they figure out that if they measure the circulating endothelial progenitor cells and they compare to the chronic heart diseases, they figured out that they is correlated very well or irreversibly correlated them. For example, as you know that the progenitor cells or the stem cells is important in the healing mechanism. And these cells is in the circulation as well, not only in the tissue, but in the circulation as well. So there are several types of the CD marker that can be used to specify these cells, such as the CD34, CD133, and the VEGF2R. And it can be found in the bloodstream, and the function is that if you do have any kind of injury in the vasculature, these progenitor cells is going to home there, and start to differentiate to the surrounding cells, such as the endothelial cells, or so on and so on. So what they did, they measure the endothelial progenitor cell colony forming units, the number, and the forming a risk score. And they found a very strong irreversible correlation. So if somebody had a certain high, let's see, relatively high number of these EP cells, they had less risk. If they had less, so relatively they did not have a good repairing function, they had, let's see, a higher cardiovascular score. Now, let's see how this theory works. First of all, this is the key point of the number of the endothelial progenitor cells. When we do have coronary vascular risk factors, they are altering the number of the progenitor cells, so they will decrease the number of the cells and promoting the formation of atherosclerosis. However, if we do have some kind of vascular protective agent, they will increase the number of the atherosclerosis and they will prevent, let's see, the formation of atherosclerosis. So what kind of things will happen, uh, the, the regression? These progenitor cells is proving or improve of the endothelial function and has the re-endothelization, reduce the plaque size and improving the angiogenesis. If those diseases that will promote the progression of atherosclerosis by decreases the number of the progenitor cells, will happen, myocardinema, ischemic stroke, erectile dysfunction, renal insufficiency, and peripheral arterial diseases. Thank you very much for your attention, and let's see what can you remember about the lecture. Let's start Kahoot!